Tell us to talk about our childhood and growing up and playing yeah. trumpet as kids. Yeah. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Go ahead. We're ready. We're on. <laughs> do, you, do you remember childhood? Well, I was telling these childhood? kids at FIU. First of all, you were, you were, your childhood took place in Brooklyn, just right. for the record. Yeah. Mine in the Bronx. So well, when we're done with this, we should fight. No, I don't want to fight. Okay. I, it was, well, okay, if you it was a fight leaving Brooklyn when I was ready. Where, where exactly? In well, Brooklyn? I grew up in Brighton Beach in Brooklyn, and uh, I learned how to play the trumpet from my father. And he had bought a, a cornet in France from the First World War made in Chicago. Meanwhile, in Paris, France, where he had bought this instrument, was the greatest trumpet factory in the world, where everybody who played the trumpet would go and have him come here to New York. He didn't know that, because he was a professional. He was an amateur that loved music. He used to buy these uh, piano sheets which showed them popular tunes of the day for 25 cents. Right. And that's what he was, he used to play the music. Then when I got to be eight years old, he said, Bobby, come in. He used to call me Bobby. That's short for Bupkis. Uh -huh. I was so short. You know, Bupkis is a Jewish word for me, See, a small person. They're not supposed to be there. Don't look there. I won't look there. Look no, right you look past you. Me. Right, okay. right, exactly. <laughs> you, can, or you can do that. You can, you can give it the old uh, Stevie Wonder. <laughs> so anyway, here I am, eight years old. I want to go play ball. I loved sports when I was a kid. I still love sports, but I played sports when I was a kid. So I wanted to go out and play some my father. Come in. Turns the pages to the Arvin book, the lesson book of the trumpet. And he, instead of giving me a lesson for the trumpet, he says, here, play this song, America. And all the, uh, the notes, one and three, one and two, were there. I never saw one and three. My one country tis of thee. No, America. My country tis of thee, mother. Da, 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 da. So I played it. That song. That song. Right. Then I kind of won't play it. No, come here. Play it again. So I said, all right, I'll play it again, Pop. So I played it again. He said, all right, now you can go out. Now, my interpretation of that scene was, hey, this is easy. I thought trumpet was easy until I got serious about playing the trumpet. Then I realized it's infinity how to learn how to play the trumpet. Did you realize that as you were a child? No! I just said I'm going to go play ball primarily until he, he pushed me in to play it again. Yeah, then within six months, I was playing in a school orchestra, learning how to transpose. P.S. what? 209 in Brooklyn, PS209. about five blocks from White House. And we had, in my lifetime, in those days, there used to be tremendous snowstorms. And I, here I was, without my sled, remember the sled? Yeah. When you were a kid, we had sleds in the snow. I'm walking to school, I'm walking back home. It was a, a difficult thing, but when you're a kid, you don't know what's hard. Right. It's a great adventure, leaving the house, wow, that's great. And you're in school, you left your ass off at some of the dumb things that happen, and the them they call upon you, then you get stiffened up, and you get very smart because you don't want to get left back. That was, in a Jewish household, that's a shanda, which means that's a bad thing. Yes. So you always have to be on your toes when you go to school. Otherwise, you get a frost and pisk, which means you slap the shit out of you. Right. You know about Yiddish? A little bit. A little bit. Well, that's a little bit I know, too. Right. But I know all the Jewish curse words. So how quickly did you learn the trumpet? And how, and how, did, it, how did that? Uh... I just finished telling you. Quickly? I'm playing in an, in an orchestra of other people in six months. Right. I was a quick one, plus the fact they had school plays, right? In public school my, where I lived. Right. I was in every school play, a major role, speaking role. Why? Because there was radio, there was no TV. And I used to listen to Al Jolson sing, Eddie Cantor sing, and I would sing it right back. So little did I realize I was getting air training because I sang the melody just like they sang it. So that when I had to play the trumpet and learn outside of America, I learned the music that was given to me, 
I could place it because I knew about where it was. Yeah. I could sing yeah, into song, the trumpet. That song is called My Country Tis of Thee. That's just the first words. That's not the title. The title is America, the, America period. America the Beautiful is a whole other song. That's term. another song. Yeah. America, America the Beautiful is a different song. Then America? Yeah. What about I Want to Be in America? That's West something Side you might have written. I want to be sure. in America. <laughs> da, 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 da. Okay. I know that okay. tune. No, I just wanted to straighten that out. Yeah. So back in Brooklyn, and so did you feel like you, you were growing up faster because you played the trumpet? Let me tell you something. I wasn't too bright as a youngster. What you're saying is something very bright, and I didn't know about that. I just had the blinkers on and I played the trumpet. And then because of my home life, wasn't, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody because my mother and father didn't agree about anything. Right. So there was always arguments. And we were very poor. And uh, we had what they called at that time, home relief. Right. And home relief meant people would sponsor you, give you credit, right. you know? What and they so, call welfare now. Now they call that welfare, right. But in this respect, because my father would have a good job in the summertime, and pay off all his debts for the winter, and then start all over again. And we had candy stores in this place, and that place, and that place, always behind money, right. always worried about money. So that was always in my mind. So that when I got serious about playing the trumpet, I wanted to give my parents a high school education. But when I got my diploma, I skipped. I went to New York. And before I went to New York, I made sure I could play the very well on the trumpet, to the point where they'd be happy to have me play in their orchestra. And I, that first year, I made an IRS report, right? I was 18. There was 18 different band leaders on that report. And I got to tell you something about the IRS. I went to Cleveland and spent two weeks there with a New England band, and I spent money, everything. And when the, all of a sudden the IRS says, we have to come for an interview. We want to check your IRS report. So I said, okay, I got my... So I had a woman. She said, uh, I've been in Cleveland two weeks and this and all that. Do you have any bills to show for that? I said, no. <laughs> Miss Muffet said on the top of it, right? What do I have to have a receipt? Then uh, I eat those two weeks. Then I rest someplace those two weeks, spend money, transportation, I send money home, didn't I do that? I did that, why are you not believing me? Mr. Cohen, you don't have a bill to support this, we can't take that for granted. So from that, I learned a lesson. After that, any kind of a slip of check that I had, I saved it. So when they came to me a few years later, I had a pile of records. Here, have fun. Read up. Read up. And in a half an hour, I was out of there. No problem. Oh he got tired of tabulating all my little chit-chat, 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 chit-chat. I wanted to have them understand, what are you doing to me? I'm a small-time operator. What, are you carrying on like a, like a, a big wheel? Right. How much money was I making? I guaranteed 35 bucks a week with this New England band and sent 18 bucks home. So, so you mentioned a, a New England band. The Fenton Brothers. Fenton Brothers. F-E-N-T-O-N. One was a sax player. I think they named it narcotic at the fentanyl. I don't know about narcotics. I was too young at that oh, time. Okay. It was way above my head. Rudy Valley was supposed to have sponsored that group. The Fenton Brothers. Fenton Brothers. But in yeah. those days, there were bands from different areas. Oh, Sly Shrimmon, Sly Shrimmon, all of us from Boston. The GAC, uh, all the, uh, the, uh, the officers eventually became very big, and some had to drop out because they couldn't handle it. Right. You know. And but, what other bands were among those bands you played in your early teens? Well, when I was a youngster, I played the Brooklyn Roseland with... Um, there was a Roseland? In the Brooklyn, there was a Brooklyn Roseland. In, I didn't know that. I know you do. Well, I'm a little older than you. Little. Uh, so you're a young fellow, right. yeah. No Brooklyn Roseland in my time. There was a Brooklyn Roseland. There was Roseland. And we had to play with... Two trumpets, two trombones, four saxes, and three rhythm. And there was a, uh, at that time, there was a, a young clowner player played well because that was a, the era of Benny Goodman, Artie Shaw, and this guy was a, a not a carbon copy, but a, almost like a carbon copy, you know. So I met a lot of people, not from Brooklyn, 
from England, New England, Boston, Chicago, Toronto, and I made a lot of contacts, and they liked the way I played, and they recommended me to other bands. And, and I had a, then I said I was a success, but I never felt it until I was with a really big band, until I got with Charlie Barnett. And I was a kid, he played Brighton Beach, the Brighton Beach Bats, which was only two blocks from me, and I heard Charlie Barnett's band. I said, and there I am, the only white trumpet player. They're not there. And, and Barnett's band. We had Peanuts Holland. Peanuts Holland. Singer and trumpet player. Howard McGee, who I became very dear friends with. When did he lose an eye? Howard? When I met him, he was that way. So he always was one eye. As far as I'm concerned. Right. Uh, and I didn't know he only had one eye. You give me information I was not aware of. Well, I don't know either. He had a patch. So I don't know what was behind it. Maybe you saw him with a patch, but when I knew him, he didn't have a patch. So he had an eye that just wasn't working. Maybe, when you saw him then. Right. Maybe he was in trouble at that time. Right. I met him when he was still young, because I was young, right. you know? We used to hang out together. Wherever he went, I went with him. Like, I, like it was like white and white, white, white. Because I didn't know anything, especially in association with people. Because naturally, at one, as a child in Brooklyn, my parents, I was ashamed to invite anybody over to the house. Maybe they would hear an argument. I didn't want to know that, you know? I went to their place, to their house, right. and it was very nice people, but I wouldn't let invite anybody to the house. And that's why I was very inward, right. all the things. That, so when I got out to Broadway and stayed at the Forest Hotel, I met all these guys at the bar, the Forest Bar, I was in seventh heaven. I, people, right. I don't have to hear no more arguments. You know? And I stayed at the Forest Bar, we had two rooms. I paid $7 a week for a room at the Forest Hotel between Broadway and 8th Avenue and 49th Street. And I had two roommates, two guys from Boston. One, the drummer was Ralph Tilkin, the trombone player was Sam Cublin. And Ralph Tilkin was, a, was a 10 to 12 years older than I was. He got me with Hal McIntyre. The, he, Hal McIntyre liked Duke Ellington. So he had a Duke Ellington type band. Now I replaced a Dixieland trumpet player, okay? And I had heard Dizzy Gillespie, and my career was in. Because I was a bebopper. I wanted to play bebop. I listened to records all the time with Disney Gillespie uptown. And after being with the band for about two weeks, I knew I didn't fit in. First of all, I was 18. These were all pros, oh, many years. The band was a good band, but I had to leave because I felt that they missed the trumpet player who was there before and his style. My style was who very was much that? style. I forgot who the Disney player was. He was from Pittsburgh. I remember that. But I never really met him. Let's go to uh, when. Did, how did you become a lead trumpet player? Talk a little bit about lead trumpet playing. What that means. Oh well, lead trumpet player means that you take the responsibility of your voice leading this band of seventeen men. Tell me about it. They're not there. Well, I felt so strong and what I knew about how to play the trumpet, when they gave me the first trumpet part, I welcomed that part. Because I'm going to show these people, including myself, I'm a good reader, sight reader, and I set the pace for the rest of the band. Right. And if they followed me, God bless them. If they didn't, I didn't care because I'm playing for the leader. I felt the responsibility towards him. If he liked me, I had the job secure. And. Uh, to play lead trumpet, you take that responsibility willingly because you want to be a lead trumpet player. That's a very important part. Your attitude to play lead trumpet means that you're the boss. And even though it was a little snot nose, I wanted to be the boss. Right. It was my personality that served itself after letting my mother and father be the boss. Now I was the boss. Thank God. I remember when you were teaching me to play, lead was about taking charge. Right and being in front of it. I remember you were saying that you need to play in a way so that your sound is just slightly in front of it all, leading. Does you, well, you, you find out that concept in terms of... Well, I only found out, out by playing with different bands that everybody depended on you because you were the lead trumpet. Nobody would try to fool around with the lead trumpet player because he's the boss. The drums and you control the band. Uh, 
I have a story to tell you about playing lead trumpet. Eventually, I worked at CBS Radio. Radio. I worked with Ray Block, famous conductor. Ray Block. 30 strings and orchestra. And Ray Block used to conduct like this. What kind of downbeat is that? I said, I said to the third trumpet player, Phil Capricano, famous third trumpet player, I said, how do you know when to come in? So he said, Paul, when you're ready to come in, this band will follow you. So he put me at ease, because I know how to lead. Right. So I used to play, and then at intermission, before the broadcast, I'd hang out with these Italian violin players to go to an Italian restaurant. That's the first time I ate Italian. So when they would order, I would wait for what they ordered, and I'd say, can I just taste that? Huh? Oh, that's good. Can I have some of that? Uh, 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 uh. And then I went over there, oh, that looks good. Can I have some of that? That's how I learned how to eat Italian. And they liked it, they and enjoyed it. Players. These kids loved me because I was just a little kid. You know? right. And I'm playing a big job. Right. And then we would do the program. I ate a lot because of quiet my nerves. And after all, I had to look at a shadow of a conductor. I didn't have this sweep down. Right. I had this. And also the whole growing up, the way you grew up, probably impacted the. Uh, oh, it, it helped my a level of anxiety. My, it, it changed my personality to where I was more aggressive, until I met my first analyst, a very dear friend of mine, Harvey Strider. I worked with him, and he told me, Paul, you know, you're a little too confrontational. He put it politically. He said, what you need is go to a psychoanalyst. But I'll give you my psychoanalyst address. You should go to him. So I went for a year and a half, and this man was great because he straightened me out of a lot of things, you know. One of the things he told me... At what point in, the, in your life was this? I was about 1920. I don't remember the exact year, but I was very young. And I was working with people much older than me right. and knew how to, the ways and wars, don'ts and this. I had to learn the do's and don'ts and watch this and all that. And I'm just like a little kid that throws, you throw them in the water, learn how to swim. So here I am, I didn't know anything from Brooklyn. I'm looking to get out of the house so I can meet people on their level. This is something that was very new to me. Because right. uh, I didn't know about this. I had to learn, I had to catch up. Right. So in catching up, I learned a lot of things fast because I wanted to. So what was the subject of your psychoanalysis? What kinds of things came up in psychoanalysis? I was very aware of people talking about me, even though they weren't. Oh. You know what I mean? That's a classic symptom. That's a classic symptom. He had to handle that. And one thing he told me is, Paul, you're going to, and this guy was a, he played the cello. He was a musician himself, this analyst. He said, you know, sometimes you're going to meet somebody, he's going to like somebody else in the chair that you want to be. He said,